Hello everyone and welcome to Let's Read with Soldier Hawk. I wish, as probably every Half-Life fan does, that this was a Let's Play. But it's not. That's not how the gods chose to deal the cards. So a Let's Read this shall be. Um, obviously we're talking about Mark Laidlaw's Epistle 3. Um, which we're going to read together and talk about. Hopefully this won't be boring as hell for everyone who's already read it. Um, and I have read through it a couple times because if I'm going to read things uh, out loud, it's best not to do that entirely blind. Ask me how I know that. Eight years of theater class. Trust me. Don't read a script you haven't read. At least not me. I'm sure there are people who can do it. I am not one of them, nor am I a voice actor, so you're going to have to forgive how much this may or may not suck. But either way, we're going to read this. We're going to talk about it. It's going to be a good time. Um, of note, I'm using one of the quote-unquote corrected versions, which set the, uh, you know, set the names to what the, the proper character names and not the uh, stand-ins that Mr. Laidlaw had to use. Um, the only problem I have with this correction is that it changed Epistle 3 to Episode 3. Now, I, I understand why the corrector changed Epistle to Episode, but that, that's the only edit that really bothers me because there's... A reason Laidlaw said, called it Epistle and not Episode. He could have called it Episode 3 without a problem. I legally, I, I think. Um, it's not like Episode is a trademarked name. Um, he called it Epistle because that's exactly what it is. It's an Epistle, a letter from Gordon to us. And changing it to episode kind of takes away from that a little bit. Uh, if I can go all English major uber nerd digression on you. There used to be, well there still is, they aren't done much anymore, but there used to be a big, an entire genre of novel called an epistolary novel, which is basically a novel made up of letters. Like the original Dracula is the real famous example of that. The story is told entirely uh, using letters between different characters. It's actually really cool. And I love that Laidlaw chose to do this in this particular format. Okay. I've used my English degree once this year. I've checked that box. Let's get back to... Epistle slash Episode 3 by Mark Laidlaw. I think the way we're going to handle this is go read a paragraph, comment on a paragraph, unless there's a paragraph that doesn't really warrant any commentary, in which case we'll just move right along. Uh, but let's, let's get started, shall we? Epistle 3 by Mark Laidlaw. Dearest player, I hope this letter finds you well. I can hear your complaints already. Gordon Freeman, we have not heard from you in ages. Well, if you care to hear excuses, I have plenty. The greatest of them being, I've been off in other dimensions and whatnot, unable to reach you by the usual means. This was the case until 18 months ago when I experienced a critical change in my circumstances and was redeposited on these shores. In the time since... I have been able to think occasionally about how best to describe the intervening years, my years of silence. I do first apologize for the wait, and, that done, hasten to finally explain, albeit briefly, quickly, and in very little detail, events following those described in my previous letter referred to herewith as Epistle 2. That's quite the intro, huh? Um, there's not a whole lot to say about that first, uh, first bit, except how cool it is to hear Gordon's voice for the very first time. 
just seriously think about that. That's one of the reasons I'm so happy and why I think it was probably no accident that Laidlaw made this a letter. Not only is that more personal, but after 10 years, I don't even remember. I don't remember when the original Half-Life was made. Um, 10, 15 years, Gordon's been a silent protagonist. You know, everyone's commenting on how he never talks. He's never gotten, he's done a lot. But he's never got to actually say anything for himself. And here, at the very end of his story, he finally gets a voice. And we get to hear him talk directly to us. I love that. Love it so much. To begin with, as you may recall from the closing paragraph of my previous missive, the death of Eli Vance shook us all. The resistance team was traumatized, unable to be sure how much of our plan might be compromised and whether it made any sense to go on at all as we had intended. And yet, once Eli had been buried, we found the strength and the courage to regroup. It was the strong belief of his brave daughter, the feisty Alec Vance, that we should continue on as her father wished. We had the Arctic coordinates transmitted by Eli's longtime assistant, Dr. Judith Mossman, which we believed to mark the location of the lost research vessel, Borealis. Eli had felt very strongly that the Borealis should be destroyed rather than allow it to fall into the hands of the Combine. Others on our team disagreed, believing that the Borealis might hold the secrets to the revolution's success. Either way, the arguments were moot until we found the vessel. Therefore, immediately after the service for Dr. Vance, Alex and I boarded a helicopter and set off to the Arctic. A much larger support team, mainly militia, was to follow by separate transport. So, as a Half-Life fan, this might be the most important paragraph in the entire document. To me, personally. Just because this finally gives us a little bit of closure for Alex and Eli. I mean, that... I don't have to tell you, that fade-out at the end of episode 2 was brutal. So brutal. I mean, God, not only does it fade out... She's crying over the body of her father... And her sobs are the last thing you see over the bl here, are the last thing you hear over the black screen before the credits roll. Like, damn, that is, that is not okay. That wouldn't be okay, even if we knew that there was going to be a sequel. That wouldn't be okay. But to leave it like that for so long, it's just ugh. So this is so important. <coughs> We finally, finally, finally Alex leaves that spot over her father's corpse and gets to bury him and mourn properly. And um, I'm looking for the right word, not, not deal with it because you don't just deal with something like that, but at least there's some closure. For her and for us, there's some closure. She's gotten up from that floor. She's buried her father, cried her tears. There's a service. That's done. I really love that. Honestly, if it ended here, I would be okay with that. <laughs> Almost. I mean, it's... It's nothing that you couldn't already picture in your head or imagine happening. I mean, of course you can, but head canon is never the same as the word of God, you know? All right. It is still unclear to me exactly what brought down our little aircraft. 
The following hours spent traversing the frigid wastes in, in a blizzard are also a jumbled, jumbled blur, ill-remembered and poorly defined. The next thing I clearly recall is our final approach to the coordinates Dr. Mossman had provided and where we expected to find the Borealis. What we found instead was a complex, fortified installation showing all the hallmarks of the sinister combine technology. It surrounded a large open field of ice. Of the Borealis itself, there was no sign, or not at first. But as we stealthily infiltrated the combine installation, we noticed a recurrent, strangely coherent aural effect, as if of a vast hologram fading in and out of view. This bizarre phenomenon initially seemed an effect caused by an immense combine lensing system. Alex and I soon realized that what we were actually seeing was the research vessel Borealis itself phasing in and out of existence at the focus of the combine devices. The aliens had erected their compound to study and seize the ship whenever it materialized. What Dr. Mossman had provided were not the coordinates for where the sub was located, but instead for where it was predicted to arrive. The vessel was oscillating in and out of our reality. Its pulses were gradually steadying, but there was no guarantee it would settle into place for long, or at all. We determined that we must put ourselves in, into position to board it at the instant it became completely physical. So really, the only question this leaves me with here is, at what point did Shell come upon the Borealis? So it certainly didn't have any of this holographic fading in and out of existence thing that Alex and Gordon discovered. And obviously at some point it, it faded out of existence at the at the Aperture facility, which was if the ending of Portal 2 well, and the ending of Portal 1 is any indication, it's certainly not in the Arctic. But I guess, I guess questions as to how that worked are, <laughs> are never going to be answered. Those kinds of unanswered questions I can live with, though. I don't mind that too much. At this point, we were briefly detained, not captured by the Combine as we feared at first, but by minions of our former nemesis, the conniving and duplicitous Walter Wallace Breen. Dr. Breen was not as we had last seen him, which is to say he was not dead. At some point, the Combine had saved out an earlier version of his consciousness, and upon his physical demise, they had imprinted the backup personality into a biological blank resembling an enormous slug. The Breen Grub, despite occupying a position of relative power in the Combine hierarchy, seemed nervous and frightened of me in particular. Wallace did not know how his previous incarnation, the original Dr. Breen, had died. He knew only that I was responsible. Therefore, the slug treated us with great caution. Still, he confessed, never able to keep quiet for long, that he was himself a prisoner of the Combine. He took no pleasure from his current grotesque existence and pleaded with us to end his life. Alex believed that a quick death was more than Wallace Breen deserved, but for my part, I felt a modicum of pity and compassion. Out of Alex's sight, I might have done something to hasten the slug's demise before we proceeded. Hmm. So, I guess the theories were correct in that slug we saw escape in episode 2 was actually Dr. Breen after all. Man. Talk about a nasty existence. Imp not, not only having your conscience, your consciousness implanted into a giant slug, but a backup of your consciousness. That has got to be a trip. No wonder the poor guy wanted to die. And good for Gordon that he did. I, uh, I totally understand Alex not wanting to help him at all, but I'm glad Gordon decided that that was the right thing to do. <laughs> Funny that the slug is scared of Gordon. Of course it is. Not 
Not far from where we had been detained by Dr. Breen, we found Judith Mossman being held in a combine interrogation cell. Things were tense between Judith and Alex, as might be imagined. Alex blamed Judith for her father's death, news of which Judith was devastated to hear for the first time. Judith tried to convince Alex that she had been a double agent serving the resistance all along, doing only what Eli had asked of her, even though she knew it meant she risked being seen by her peers, by all of us, as a traitor. I was convinced, Alex less so. But from a pragmatic point of view, we depended on Dr. Mossman, for along with the Borealis coordinates, she possessed resonance keys which would be necessary to bring the vessel fully into our plane of existence. We skirmished with Combine soldiers protecting a Combine research post. Then Dr. Mossman attuned the Borealis to precisely the frequencies needed to bring it into brief coherence. In the short time available to us, we scrambled aboard the ship with an unknown number of Combine agents closely behind. The ship cohered for only a short time, and then its oscillations resumed. It was too late for our own military support, which arrived and joined the Combine forces in battle just as we rebounded between universes, once again unmoored. So, we finally find out what the Borealis kind of actually is, although actually we'll find out a little bit more later. But uh, Dr. Mossman is the big thing in those two paragraphs. Was she a spy? Was she actually working for Eli? she lying to our face just so she doesn't get shot by Alex? We don't know. We don't know. And we never do actually find out, although maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe that doesn't matter so much in the end. What happened next is even harder to explain. Alex Vance, Dr. Mossman, and myself sought control of the ship, its power source, its control room, its navigation center. The ship's history proved non-linear. Years before, during the Combine invasion, various members of an earlier science team, working in the hull of a dry dock vessel situated in the Aperture Science Research Facility in Michigan, had assembled what they called a bootstrap device. If it worked as intended, it would emit a field large enough to surround the ship. This field would then itself travel instantaneously to any chosen destination without having to cover the intervening space. There was no need for entry or exit portals or any other devices. It was entirely self-contained. Unfortunately, the device had never been tested. As the Combine pushed Earth into the Seven Hour War, the aliens seized control of our most important research facilities. The staff of the Borealis, with no other wish than to keep the ship out of Combine hands, acted in desperation. They switched on the field and flung the Borealis towards the most distant destination they could target, Arctica. When they did, what they did not realize was that the bootstrap device traveled in time as well as space, nor was it limited to one time or one location. The Borealis, and the moment of its activation, were stretched across space and time, between the nearly forgotten Lake Huron of the Seven Hour War and the present day Arctic, it was pulled taut as an elastic band, vibrating, except where at certain points along its length one could still find points like the harmonic spots along a vibrating guitar string. One of these harmonics was where we boarded, but the string ran forward and back in both time and space, and we were soon pulled in every direction ourselves. Time grew confused. Looking from the bridge, we could see the dry dock of the Aperture Science at the moment of teleportation, just as the Combine forces closed in from land, sea, and air. At the same time, we could see the Arctic wasteland where our friends were fighting to make their way to the Protean Borealis, and in addition, glimpses of other worlds somewhere in the future, perhaps, or even in the past. Alex grew convinced we were seeing one of the Combine's central staging areas for invading other worlds, such as our own. We meanwhile fought a running battle throughout the ship pursued by combine forces. We struggled to understand our situation and to agree on, a cor on our course of action. Could we alter the course of the Borealis? Should we run to ground in the Arctic, giving our peers the chance to study it? Should we destroy it with all hands aboard, our own included? 
It was impossible to hold a coherent thought given the baffling and paradoxical time loops which passed through the ship like bubbles. I felt I was going mad, that we all were, confronting myriad versions of ourselves in the ship that was half ghost ship, half nightmare funhouse. What it came down to at last was a choice. Judith Mossman argued reasonably that we should save the Borealis and deliver it to the resistance that our intelligent peers might study and harness its power. But Alex reminded but Alex reminded me she had sworn she would honor her father's demand that we destroy the ship. She hatched a plan to set the Borealis to self destruct while riding it into the heart of the Combine's invasion nexus. Judith and Alex argued Judith overpowered Alex and brought the Borealis a and brought the Borealis area, preparing to shut off the bootstrap device and settle the ship onto the ice. Then I heard a shot, and Judith fell. Alex had decided for all of us, or her weapon had. With Dr. Mossman dead, we were committed to the suicide plunge. Grimly, Alex and I armed the Borealis, creating a time-traveling missile, and steered it for the heart of the Combine's command center. And so we never do ultimately know what to make of Judith. There's no convenient answer there. We don't even know if she advocates for her plan because she genuinely believes that the Borealis is something that will help the war, or if it's simply because she doesn't want to die. She's a... well, I guess kind of like G-Man. She's a, she's a mystery that never has an answer. We don't ever find out what her real motive was or what the truth about her is. We can only, can only guess. It does sound like an ama amazing set piece though, doesn't it? Running through the ship as it's shifting through reality. It also sounds like a level that would annoy the ever-loving crap out of me personally. <laughs> but boy, would it be a spectacle to play through. I've heard, uh, I heard rumors that there, there are some modders who are trying to make this, actually make this in the game. And all I can say is, man, good luck with that. Because trying to turn that paragraph into actual gameplay, holy shit. <laughs> Maybe there's a reason episode 3 never got made. <laughs> At this point, as you will no doubt be unsurprised to hear, a certain sinister figure appeared in the form of that sneering trickster, G-Man. For once he appeared not to me, but to Alex Vance. Alex had not seen the cryptical schoolmaster since childhood, but she recognized him instantly. Come along with me now, we've places to go and things to do, said G-Man, and Alex acquiesced. She followed the strange grey man out of the Borealis, out of our reality. For me, there was no convenient door held open, only a snicker and a sideways glance. I was left alone riding the weaponized research vessel into the heart of a combine world. An immense light blazed. I caught a cosmic view of a brilliant, glittering Dyson sphere. The vastness of the combine's power, the, futi the futility of our struggle, blossomed briefly in my awareness. I saw everything. Mainly, I saw how the Borealis, our most powerful weapon, would register as less than a fizzling match head as it blew itself apart and what remained of me would be even less than that. Just then, as you have surely also foreseen, the Vortigons, part of their own checkered curtains of reality, reached in as they have done on prior occasions, plucked me out, and set me aside. I barely got to see the fireworks begin. Now that, that paragraph, my friends, that is some vintage Beautiful Mark Lane Law writing. That is, oh, God. I wish I could forget his novels and reread them again. 
just so I could read paragraphs like that again for the first time. It, one of the great themes, not of all of his work, but Laidlaw really likes to write almost Lovecraftian stories about not necessarily the tentacle monster Lovecraftian stuff, although he does do that too, but more Lovecraft in the sense of if you ever understood, understood the actual scale and size of the universe of all possible knowledge, you know, of any of a number of things, the human mind just isn't built to comprehend that. And if you even understood a fraction of it, you would go insane. That is captured so well in this paragraph, this beautiful moment where Gordon realizes that nothing humanity can possibly do would even register on the scale, would even register a blip on the radar of the combine, of the full might of the combine. Oh, I love it so much. <laughs> this is, without question, my favorite paragraph in the whole thing. And that's, that's not even counting, like, that's not even the important part. This is the, this is the English major in me nerding out about Mark Laidlaw, but, like, plot-wise, holy, holy shit, you guys. So, not only does Alex definitely know who G-Man is, he's referred to as a schoolmaster. So, there's that. And then... She's willing to abandon Gordon to die to follow him after not having seen him in probably 15 or 20 years. What the hell? What the hell is the connection between those two? If, I mean, I suppose, I suppose if she actually did leave, Willingly. I mean, God only knows what G-Man can do, right? But the way this is written, it really sounds like she's willing to just ditch Gordon to follow what G-Man asked. Which is, talk about a mind screw. Wow. That, that's, that point requires more thought and probably a full article. To unpack. That's not for this kind of rambling. It does, however, answer the question, is Gordon important for himself? And the answer to that is decidedly no. Absolutely not. Alex is important. And in fact, the only re reason Gordon was even saved at the end of the first half-life was probably so he could act as an escort for Alex. They threw him in cold storage until he was needed and gave him the task to get Alex safely to where she needed to be. And once he had, his job was done. G-Man's a cold bastard, though. Wow. And, of course, the Vort saved the day because... Vorts are awesome, and we love them. And here we are. I spoke of my return to this shore. It has been a circuitous path to lands I once knew, and surprising to see how much the terrain has changed. Enough time has passed that few remember me, or what I was saying when I last spoke, or what precisely we hoped to accomplish. At this point the resistance will have failed or succeeded, no thanks to me. Old friends have been silenced or fallen by the wayside. I no longer know or recognize most members of the research teams, though I believe the spirit of rebellion still persists. I expect you know better than I the appropriate course of action, and I leave you to it. Expect no further correspondence from me regarding these matters. This is my final epistle. 
Yours in infinite finality. Gordon Freeman, Ph.D. <sighs> wow. So, not exactly a happy ending for our favorite doctor. But, maybe a peaceful one? Definitely bittersweet. Which is laid law all over. There was no way this was going to be a happy ending. But, maybe he at least got some measure of peace now that people aren't paying attention to them and he's able to pass on the mantle of the resistance to another group or another generation. It really is a beautiful send-off both for Gordon and from Mr. Laidlaw to the fans. Just really kind of touching and beautiful. <laughs> And I love Gordon's voice. He sounds... He sounds like a non-absent-minded Dr. Kleiner is actually what he sounds like. Reading the way... Well, maybe not the way he talks, but reading the way he writes. You can almost hear Kleiner in his voice. And I suppose a little bit of Eli, too, although Eli wasn't really into dropping the Ten dollar words. The way that Gordon seems to be. <laughs> Gordon definitely wears his MIT diploma in his vocabulary. But, uh... I think, I think that's going to do it for this read-through. Um, I'll probably have more to say about it in depth later after it's got more time to percolate. And, frankly, I do better deep thinking typing than I do talking. So this was a this was definitely a kind of first reaction sort of thing and maybe we can see what sort of articles we can get out on this in the next month or two. Um just for some housekeeping, thank you again for being so patient while I was while I was gone. We had a we had a death in my family, someone pretty close to me. So I had to fly fly overseas to go see her and then handle her affairs. That was a that was definitely not a fun not a fun thing to do. And uh, one of the reasons it took me a little while to get back into the swing after I got back. But uh back we are. And so next weekend I think we're going to do something entirely unrelated to half life. Maybe uh maybe get back into um Spec Ops. We haven't touched that since July. I probably won't remember how to play it. But, yeah. We'll probably do some spec ops. Um, and, as always, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Patreon, etc. And, uh, until next weekend, uh, I will see you next time.